All right, good afternoon. Uh, it's two, so we'll get started. We'll probably have some people coming in, which is perfectly fine. Uh, I'm Saeed Chaudhary from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm the director of the uh, Open Source Programs Office there. I'm joined by Stephanie Luigi, who's going to introduce herself from UC Santa Cruz. And we're here to talk to you today about OSPOs and academia. We're just trying to give you two case studies, sort of a landscape analysis of what's happening and some of the things we're trying to do through our OSPOs and a uh, new network of OSPOs that have come together called Curious. Uh, so one question that sometimes we're asked is why are universities launching OSPOs? Uh, well, reality is that for many of the same reasons that you might have OSPOs or you might be involved with an OSPO. Um, there's developer relations, developer practices, there's compliance, there's all those wonderful things that you might think of. But there are also some unique reasons as well. Uh, so if you went to Nithya Russ talk earlier today, uh, one theme that came up during the Q&A was culture and the role that an OSPO plays in sort of cultivating the culture, managing the culture, nudging the culture is the word I think she used. Uh, and the culture in a university is very, very different. Uh, the mission is different, the, the roles are different, the level of autonomy and so on uh, is, is very, very different. And it has a lot to do with things like academic freedom or tenure uh, and so on. And one of the points she also talked about was the to-do group OSPA maturity stages, starting off with OSS adoption uh, and then getting to things like legal education, community education, uh, community engagement. The patterns for OSS adop adoption in a university are very diverse. <laughs> and that's a euphemism. <laughs> uh, and even the legal environment is very different. So CMU's like most universities that we don't make a cl IP claims on student work. Uh, it's not like a lot of universities. And CMU doesn't make IP claims on faculty work either, on faculty open source. So having a conversation around the legal aspect with someone who owns the, the IP but doesn't necessarily understand <laughs> what those implications might be, just gives you a sense that even if it may be the same kind of role or function, it's very different uh, in the university context. And that, of course, has to do with the mission as well. Uh, I'm going to be focusing more on some of the research aspects, but there's the teaching and the technology transfers aspects, which I know Stephanie will cover. And another person who I very much respect is Duane O'Brien. Uh, he's been working with me when I used to be at Johns Hopkins beforehand and now also at Carnegie Mellon. <clears throat> so he's learning a lot more about universities. And during a recent call, he actually he said this to me. He said, it seems like open source is actually like a continuum in the private sector. It's, con it's something we constantly do. It's part of this broader kind of process. It's tied to our products and so on. It seems like in the university concept, uh, context, it's a bunch of milestones. <laughs> Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about more about what that might mean. So this is from the OSPO webpage at Carnegie Mellon. You can read it as easily as I can. And you'll see a lot of things that seem very familiar uh, that you might think of. Well, sure, that's what you know, our OSPO does, or that's what I think an OSPO should be doing. Uh, but one hint, if you will, of the sort of difference in context is in one of the bullets at the bottom, which says, examine how both US federally funded research and development centers and university-affiliated research centers can develop open source policies, practice, processes, and programs. So this term, FFRDC and UARC, is something you'll hear a lot in research-intensive universities. It means almost nothing to people outside of university. So this is the kind of thing uh, that I think is important to keep in mind. And I'll give you one particular sort of case study uh, that, that demonstrates some of these points. And that has to do with what's called the CMU Cloud Lab. So this is a facility that is being built. It's supposed to go live, I believe, this month or the latest next month. Uh, it's a little bit off-site. It's part of a CMU building, but it's a little bit off-site from the main campus. It has hundreds of different of, of, of instrumentation for material science, chemistry, uh, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, and so on. Uh, a lot of things around materials production, energy, you know, batteries, those types of things. And it's a remote control lab. So anyone with an internet connection at CMU and then eventually beyond can control all these instruments and do a bunch of different kinds of experimentation there. <clears throat> now, it was originally started uh, by a group called Emerald Cloud Lab. Two CMU alumni uh, went to the Bay Area and built a facility for Bay Area startup companies to do this work. So it's taking that framework model system and applying it now into the university context. Now, you can imagine in the Bay Area, those companies did not want to share with each other for obvious reasons. But when you move to the university context, 
we're not talking about what it means to openly share in this, in this kind of platform. Uh, and that's been affirmed by you know, visits from the ECL team to CMU and, and talking to the faculty and so on. So you have this sort of inherently closed system that we're kind of opening up, if you will. And it's not sufficient to just open source, say the software is open source, right? Because there's data, there's hardware, there's protocols, there's methods, there's AI, machine learning, and so on. Uh, it's this complex set where if I say, well, here's my code, I may still not be able to figure out what you're doing or how to use what you're doing uh, and how to do things in a reproducible way. Um, one of the conversations that I've been having with the Emerald Cloud Lab team is if you want to connect this to that whole federal funding landscape, you have to be aware of the policy structures that are in place. So every federal agency, of, well, actually at this point, any federal funding agency has to adhere to something called the public access uh, compliance policies that have come out of the White House Office of Science and Technology policy. There's been two memos in 2013 and 2023 that basically say any outputs from federally funded research need to be publicly available. The White House also declared 2023 the year of open science. So it's a very strong kind of signal that this needs to happen. So in talking to ECL, basically they understand if this is to be part of, say, for example, funding from the National Institutes of Health, there needs to be more openness in this. But I will say that when they said, okay, this is important, we get it, uh, we're gonna open source our programming language. And I thought, well, that, that's fantastic, that's great. That's a really good development. So I'm still figuring out what that means because it isn't exactly what I think of open source and that I don't think there's a publicly available GitHub repo or take your pick repo. There aren't licenses attached and so on. So it's a conversation that we're having repeatedly at CMU. These are some of the smartest people in the world, but they don't necessarily know about licenses. They certainly, in some cases, they didn't even realize they should have licenses. Uh, so this is the kind of back and forth that has to happen in this kind of environment. It's very complex. Uh, it's very nebulous. You have people who have a lot of autonomy, quite frankly. Uh, and we're trying to do that in a systematic way through something like Cloud Lab. But we have to have that conversation repeatedly with many, many faculty. So I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie to talk about the UC context. And then I'll come back at the end to talk about something called Helios. Great. Thank you. Um, Hi, yeah, I am uh, Stephanie Leachy. I am the executive director at the Center for Research and Open Source Software at UC Santa Cruz. And I've been in that role since 2016. Um, and since 2022, I'm also uh, executive director for our Open Source Program Office. And I'll explain how that it's all connected in a couple slides from now. But I wanted to go a little, one of the ideas that we had about this talk was to kind of show how different campuses get to the stage of having an OSPO, um, and um, uh, each one's different. I just want to make sure that there's a very, very much not a cookie cutter approach to OSPOs in academia. Like just like there is, like, just like with industry, all, every OSPO is you know unique uh, to the needs of the organization that it sits in. But um, I do think it's useful to kind of look at how one university got to where we're at right now. Um, now, with regards to UC Santa Cruz. Um, uh, we are very, we have his, had a very long history with open source, um, dating back to w the human genome uh, project. And um, we're very proud of the fact that it was uh, UC Santa Cruz um, uh, professors and faculty members who were the ones who open sourced the human genome and made and beat, <laughs> as we say, beat uh, the proprietary folks to, to the punch and were able to publish it prior to. Uh, the human genome being patented. And it was, um, there's a, a lot of great articles and a lot of great research out there. Actually, somebody just brought it up with me at lunch yesterday. He's like, oh, UCSC, yes, the human genome. You guys did a, that was an amazing thing you did for the world. And I'm all, I guess we know. <laughs> We're very proud of that. Um, but that was a great for us as a university, aside from the, the benefit it was to society in general, for the university and from our leadership's perspective, it really highlighted from an early stage how important the idea of open source and open science is to to the university. Um, so they're particularly been, um, uh, the, you know, it, it, they look favorably, I didn't want to say they're very open to because it sounds funny, but they're very open to open, but they look very favorably on that, um, on open source, open science. And I don't know if that's always true for universities. And I know that <laughs> Saeed will have his opinions on that as well, but and we had that benefit 
um, go, like, and that our leadership often sees open source and open science as leading to more impactful work. Um, uh, soon after, like within five years after the Human Genome uh, Project and uh, was was open sourced, and the Genomics Institute and the Human Genome Browser was created, there, another great act activity in open source was kind of percolating at UCSC. And this, in this case, it was uh, this what uh, ultimately became CEF, which is, of course, many people in this room will know because it's now as a foundation under. Uh, the Linux Foundation, it's also was you know, part of Red Hat and now part of IBM. Um, and that got started at UCSC uh, with, by, uh, as a PhD project by Sage Weil, who was a, a PhD student at the time at UC Santa Cruz. And um, he found it, he, right at, as he was finishing up his dissertation um, and was still working on Ceph, he then founded a startup that's, you know, was, okay, granted this was like a 10 year process for Sage. Um, he ended up um, selling it, the, selling, the, or selling the startup to Red Hat. With that funds, he uh, donated uh, uh, as an alumni to, back to his um, alma mater, back to UCSC, specifically aimed at um, trying to create a system where students could do what he did. Um, or at least to some extent. Now, Sage, anyone who knows Sage will know that he's very entrepreneurial. He had, uh, he had some like resources that most students, P recent PhDs won't necessarily have to be able to do the startup and move forward. But, um, but he wanted to at least create some mechanism, some way, a pathway for students to be able to not just lie, let their um, PhD projects kind of languish after uh, they, um, after they graduate. And this is also a big issue with regards to the open source work done at universities is often it's something, it's you know, a student's uh, PhD project or another project that they are doing for a class, but once they are graduated, it's, there's, that maintainer is gone, They're, the community maybe never built up around it to keep it going. And that's one of the issues that, that we, we see um, again and again within the university setting. But, uh, back to Sage, what was great was that that funding then went to c help create the organization I started working with, um, the Center for Research and Open Source Software, which was established in 2015. Now, CROSS was interesting um, and a bit unique, it still is, um, because it was very much based on, aside from the endowment funding from Sage, which we really very much appreciate and, and continue to benefit from, we also had uh, un uh, industry members. So we were able to engage with industry um, and we're able to raise about 2.5 million, I would say 2.5 or 2.6. I need to double check which one of those is right, but around that, um, uh, over the first five years. So between uh, really 2026 and, sorry, 2016 and uh, 2021. Um, and a lot of what we were doing was, again, trying to recreate some of the, you know, a, a path, recreate kind of what Sage was able to do, but then for other students. Um, but particularly working with industry uh, to support the research being done on campus, uh, within a university setting. Um, the industry liked us because they were able to work together in an open source format. So we had a lot of component makers, for instance, and they were able to use CROSS and um, the, the, fo the form that we created to kind of collaborate without it seeming like they were colluding. And it was a very useful for them as an industry as a whole. Um, we also were kind of very, uh, very um, intent on amplifying the uh, the translation of university research. So translating it to the greater society, into industry in general, into you know areas where it could be used outside of just the research enterprise. Um, and then of course a lot of it, like if we we really saw the, our uh, main focus of bridging the gap between student research and open source projects. Um, and then teaching students uh, about open source and productively engaging in open source was also like kind of critical, one of the critical um, missions that we had. And we still do, I, CROSS is still around, even with the, the activity with OSPO, we, um, but the, you know, we've changed a bit though over the last few years. And part of what the reason we changed was just, we were seeing so many more opportunities that didn't fit under what our structure, which was we are a res CROSS is a research center under the Baskin School of Engineering at UC Santa Cruz. And there's some things we could do that we could only do as a research center and other things that we wanted to do that just didn't fit. Um, this all started to happen 
about the same time as this push for open source program offices and academia uh, was starting right around 2020 when I first met Saeed and a bunch of other folks um, who were kind of still thinking about the, these things. And the Sloan Foundation, thanks to the Sloan Foundation, because they're one of the, I think, a great, a huge driver in this push for academic OSPOs. Um, and um, so, like I said, we were seeing this research, these, these activities we were doing as being uh, limited by our status, but also um, recognizing after discussions with Saeed and other folks that it's like a lot of what we're doing is actually OSPO focused, is, is something that we could see as an OSPO activity, but maybe not a research center activity. So in 2022, thanks again to the Sloan Foundation, we were able to get funding to have a pilot project to start an actual OSPO. Now, like I said, CROSS still exists. And originally, we, we were back and forth. We were glad it was a pilot project and that we were allowed a lot of um, uh, leeway and ways of, uh, uh, a lot of chances to kind of rethink how maybe our original ideas were about where we were going uh, through the pro proposal or through the project. Um, because we actually did realize it was important to have both. We, so right now, where we're at is a uh, research center still cross still exists and it still has kind of a research focus and supporting graduate student focus but it, we also uh, are, you know separate but you know connected to that ha are creating the open source program office which would sit on a more campus-wide level um, and that office specifically op is focusing on championing open source and open science and then bringing together uh, scientists, scientists, students, and sponsors, along with open source communities together and the number of mentorship programs we have. Um, also, uh, much more of a focus on educating students to work in open source communities, even beyond what we were doing in CROSS. Um, and something that we definitely weren't, weren't focused as much on CROSS, but definitely have been focusing within the OSPO, is attracting the value of open source to the UC, to UCSC and now to the UC system. Um, and that's kind of exciting because it really helps put, uh, show to leadership, not just within UCSC, which I, we, yeah, we have a little bit easier time with that because of our uh, UCSC's experience with open source, but uh, to UC wide, kind of explaining to them the importance of supporting the open source research and uh, so open source within the research enterprise. Um, and again, we still continue to focus on the similar uh, themes that, that Cross had, which was broadening engagement with industry, but also looking into government funding, like we have NSF grants, uh, the, the POSE uh, grant, as well as foundations, um, like including the Sloan Foundation. So that's what we were doing for the first two years. <laughs> for the first two years, um, our big new project, and I can officially announce it, even though I kind of have officially announced it a few times already, and we actually finally put the press release out today, um, was the Sloan Foundation funded the UC, a UC-wide network, a University of California-wide network of, um, of OSPOs. Um, so, and it's, I think, one of the single most, single largest grants ever put out by the um, by Sloan, and so we really appreciate all of the trust, and the, the uh, we're very excited about being able to do this. It covers six, so our university plus five other campuses. And for those of you who don't know the University of California system, we have 10 uh, campuses plus um, a number of national labs and medical centers as well. So long term, we're looking to hope to expand it definitely to all the campuses, um, but also into the national labs. Um, and what's great is that we have support from the um, office of the office of the president's research and innovation arm, uh, and side note is that the current VP of that office at the at UCOP at University of uh, UC uh, Office of the President was Sage Wiles advisor for his PhD project. So yeah, we kind of it kind of helps that we know that that person is in that position right now, and I know not all universities get that. And they were he was also our uh, head of are the vice chancellor for Office of Research at UCSC the entire time CROSS was getting started. So having Scott in that role was very helpful. Um, and we we're trying to leverage that as much as possible, but we also really appreciate the support from all of our university libraries because of those campuses that I'm talking about that uh, like three out of the three out of the five are focused on at least inner or at least co-managed through the, the library. Um, 
And so our goals at the moment are to strengthen collaboration among our campuses, look like to really invigorate kind of open source education within the system, um, identify, identify uh, resources. So basically we're spending two years trying to make sure we know how to actually keep, keep make this sustainable uh, as a network as well as on individual campuses. And, uh, and be, create adaptable tools to better, really better understand the landscape of the universe, uh, of open source in the universities. So that's a big one where, actually, unfortunately, uh, there is an unconference session uh, dis, uh, by John Starr talking about MOSS, the map of open source. And there's a lot of linkages between, that's happening right now, uh, there's a lot of linkages between that project and the, uh, the efforts that we're doing with, with regards to this as well. So, um, but I, and I can talk about, uh, yeah, talk about that more if people have questions. Um, and that's, so that's exciting, that's like, again, that's the, uh, what we'll be doing for the next two years plus uh, after that. And we're really excited, um, has had a really great, uh, I don't know anybody who knows how university systems work, like state level systems, a lot of campuses don't get along very well or they don't necessarily work well. I always joke about them being like kind of siblings, you know, sibling rivalries. And definitely UC system is, much, is very much like that. Um, but I have been very impressed with the extent to which um, the different campuses have wanted to work together how um, they, we've been, I, have, I, I always joke that it's like uh, um, hurting cats, but they've been really, really well-behaved cats. You know, it's like a really, it's a really been a very nice, um, a nice group of people and a nice uh, start to this network. Um, and all, each of the campuses have uniqueness to them. So we still, even within the system, don't expect all the OSPOs to kind of look alike. We all want, we all work together and leverage the expertise in the different campuses. The, the areas of excellence for the different campuses, but at the same time, um, uh, we'll definitely, you know, all have a different flavor. But um, but then ultimately work together and for the UC system, kind of be a network that allows a greater promotion of open source and open science within within the system and uh, also within you know have benefit to the state of the state of California itself. Um, and we hope to also be the model for kind of the next uh, kind of other systems that are considering doing something like this, other, other uh, statewide systems. With that, I also wanna talk a little bit about other networks, uh, OSPO networks, that with academia, and uh, say, uh, alluded to this a bit, the Curious, um, uh, the organization Curious, the, say it. Thank you. Community of, of Unity, Unit, University and Research Institution, Institution OSPOs. Thank you. I should know what it is. I am a member of it, but. Um, so it's a re relatively recent uh, uh, organization that's come up mainly through the support, again, of the um, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Originally, these are the original members. That's including us, UCSC, uh, CMU. Um, again, a lot of these are, a number of the, six of these are Sloan funded um, OSPOs and uh, plus two Lero and Trinity College Dublin are two that um, aren't funded by them but had an OSPO um, prior to like, I think they've had them at least the last couple years. Um, and then recently uh, through another grant, another round of grants from uh, the, um, from the Sloan Foundation, uh, we now have 14 members of Curious. And so, and you'll see that they're all totally different types of campuses, different types of, uh, I mean, different types of universities, they have public and private, as well, and from all over the US as well as all over the world. Although with the UC network now becoming a part of this, so all the other five campuses coming on, the Stanford guy, and the Stanford folks and I, we're kind of kidding, like we are now the biggest block. California has now the biggest block of group uh, in here. But um, what's nice is that we learn a lot from each other. Uh, again, that we're all very different, and yet there's, there are things that we share that we can, uh, don't have to kind of feel like we have to reinvent the wheel for all of us, that we learn from what the other ones are doing. We look at projects that there are uh, activities that d the different campuses are doing and go, hey, that's something that we can adapt and work on our campus, and we see like a, a, a proof of concept of the one of the other campuses does it, so it makes it easier to kind of uh, move forward and, and replicate and and, do, and this has been a really, really great group uh, to be part of um, and very helpful. Uh, it's not only, um, right now it's mainly Sloan found, uh, funded folks, but there is 
there are like uh, there's a slow growth as well of OSPOs out there that are not funded by Sloan um, or um, or other like foundations that are maybe coming organically through uh, the, their their university leadership or you know parts of their university that see it as important and that um, and those are we're also reaching out to those groups as well. Um, just a quick overview of what some of these where OSPO sit in some of these, and I, I have to uh, thank, Cl thank Claire Dillon from Curious, who actually put these slides together for us. Um, and uh, you'll see that a lot of them are in the libraries, and uh, you know, uh, Saeed's uh, uh, OSPO, for instance, is in the library, um, as well as another, a, a number of the other ones. And so that's a constant. And I was saying that in the UC system, uh, three of the campuses are also have a library situated, uh, the OSPOs are situated or somehow split with a, with the, within the library and another and kind of like shared uh, within the library and another part of campus, um, as well as COE's Center of Excellences, uh, research centers, uh, offices of research. So you see that they're actually spread around, pretty wide, wide idea within different campuses. Um, and really, again, it's a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's each campus is different. Um, it, you know, whether it's a public university, a private university, where it ends up situated really kind of depends on how um, you know how that university's how, how that university itself is situated and what's important to um, to, to to its leadership and how, it, how well, you know depending on what again it's all very unique to the to the needs and the the environment within the uni different universities. Um, we've had recently talks with um, we, we put this together. I think this was at the December event that we we had our first kind of session together, and there was a lot of interesting um, talk uh, issues that we really overlapped. The things that we saw as uh, issues we want to talk about, so goals that Curies has um, with regards to like what or the different OSPOs have about what they want to like what they want to build, what we, we want to talk about, how we want to learn from each other. And I, I won't go through all of these, but they're all you know it's a wide range of discussions that we have. And again, a lot of the focus on these discussions is how do we learn from each other and how do we learn from the different experiences we've had. And so it's very much a very collaborative and cooperative group. Um, last slide before I turn it back over to, to Saeed. This is also to highlight some of the other groups that, that have worked. Curious is one um, that have worked with. Sustain is another one for uh, academic uh, organizations or academic, it's, there's an academic working group and Sustain I OSS that um, Focuses on any, you know anyone from an academic or research institute. Maybe they don't have an OSPO yet. Um, who's interested in these subjects? OSSI. Um, people have been probably hearing about them. They are focused a lot on open science and the map of open science that that John's talking about right now is under that group. And then the chaos. Don's right here. Everybody knows what chaos is. Um, and there's an academic working group under chaos. And then Helios. I'm going to turn over for um, Seed to finish up. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so another group that's very important in the academic environment is the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, at NASEM as it's called, is a group that has a very powerful signaling function in the sense that whenever they produce a report or produce any kind of finding, the federal funding agencies, the White House, and so on, and many university leadership uh, look to those reports. And so there was one focused on open science, the so-called roundtable on open science, and a spin out or spin off from that is what's called Helios, the Higher Educational Higher Education Leadership Initiative on Open Scholarship. Uh, I think for trademark reasons, it's now called Helios Open instead of just Helios. So it's a little bit like a, I don't know, a meta term or so on. But the main point being that this is a way to get to provosts and presidents. So Stephanie and I are both very fortunate that we work in institutions where the leadership kind of gets it around open source, open science. That's not necessarily true. Uh, and Helios now has something close to 100 members. I know it was over 90 the last time I checked, but it seems to be increasing every day. So this has become a consortium where many, many university leadership, wide ranging, great you know, geographical distribution can come together to talk about these issues. And we're building a very strong connection between Curious and, uh, and Helios. So you know, one kind of takeaway that I hope you can, you can uh, take from this talk is that Claire Dillon is the lead of, of Curious, and she's doing amazing work. And of course, many of you know she was, was and is still involved with InnerSource. 
and she's talked to me about the study of patterns. The, the reality is that in universities and academia, there are many, many patterns. Every university says we're decentralized, and it's true. The, the, the level of decentralization might vary, but it's very difficult, if not impossible, to say this is what everyone will do. This is a top-down kind of direction. Now, if there are legal issues or federal policies, of course, that, that's one thing. But I, I don't mean to celebrate something that's happened in the UC system that's really quite terrible, actually, is because of one faculty member not submitting their reports on time for federal grants, the federal government has shut off all funding to the UC San, to UC San Diego, right? And has basically said, until this faculty member gets those reports done, you're not going to get another penny. That is very rare. <laughs> that is the first time that has happened, and it must be something pretty egregious, to be honest. Other than that kind of thing, it's very difficult to say in the university, this is what everyone will do, you must do it this way. The power of persuasion is incredibly important in university context. That's why we're dealing with so many of these different kinds of patterns. Maybe over time they'll coalesce, maybe they'll come together and curious in Helios or places where that might happen. But we're still very much in this generative kind of phase right now where we're trying to figure out a lot of what this might be. So I'll turn it back over to Stephanie for a wrap up and then I think maybe we'll have some time to questions we're on. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah so quickly to wrap up to give us a few more minutes for questions um, I think where we're the quick the wrap up is kind of like we are seeing that uni OSPOs and universities are really focusing on meeting specific campus needs and uh, the social needs from maybe the communities around um, the campuses as well as widely more widely um, it's also really there's a huge focus on enabling um, academic and research, the, the research missions of the universities. And that really sets us, I think, OSPOs apart in the universities apart from like industry OSPOs or from, L, you know, from OSPOs in other uh, sectors and kind of uh, what uh, Said was talking about earlier. Um, now there is definitely, a, they are proliferating worldwide. Um, and so I think that that's an important thing to see that it's not, it's a US, there's a lot in, that are building in the US, but we're also seeing a lot in, in your, the European context and hopefully um, it'll expand even further. Um, and it's really impacting how universities uh, work and collaborate. And you can see it, and I feel like I see it in the UC system uh, network that we're creating, that there's way more collaboration and, and intent on collaboration, definitely within the curious network. I'm seeing how they work together, like the OSPOs working together, broader than just if you have researchers working with researchers. There's like much more of an expansive view of how the universities can collaborate and build and re, you know build reproducible um, activities that are that are helpful to kind of the wider community um, now moving forward I think we'll see uh, that OSPO the OSPO networks will leverage most, multiple campuses it's kind of like what we're doing and we're hopefully in the next the success over the next couple years at the University of California you saw a few other uh, state uh, state systems that were on that list with curious um, like University of Texas, we're, we're already talking with our, our colleagues there about you know, how they can expand. It's University of Texas Austin, how they and the folks in Austin can expand throughout Texas, and another no, a number of other um, campuses. Um, there's definitely a hope for a more industry community campus collaboration, and through through OSPOs, kind of a little bit of our experience of, at Cross, plus a lot of the other campuses have had similar had had some experience with regards to that, and they're seeing that as a, as a good way forward. Um, and I actually de definitely think that the, and I think definitely with the Helios, what Helios uh, Open is doing, um, and so that's kind of the top-down approach, whereas a lot of the activities with the OSPOs has been the bottom-up approach, um, really creating more of a normalization of an OSPO approach as cam in, throughout campuses all over, you know, all over the US, all over the world, in a similar way that all campuses have a tech transfer office now. I think the idea would be that all campuses will also have kind of that balancing of, the, of an OSPO as well. Um, and, uh, and I think that's it. Uh, but so we have some time, we have about five minutes or so for questions. All right. Uh, start with there and then over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I did. You want? Do you have a? No, go ahead. Okay. So I think that um, 
within the university, some of the university, some of the existing OSPAs, like RIT in particular, have a really great set of best practice for their own for for universities. Um, I think that there is an opportunity for research uh, uh, that maybe OSPAs would uh, would promote for looking at how industry OSPAs work um, in different sectors. So I, I can see that being, I mean, because it's, it's really useful to maybe let, be able to leverage the, the research power of universities, um, and especially ones that have maybe have an understanding of how OSPAs are supposed to work within industry. And we all well, actually do connect with the industry OSPO community as well, like to-do group, like we're members of the to-do group, and um, I think a number of the other OSPOs are as well. So there is definitely a linkage there, so I can definitely see um, that being that area. Right now, I don't think it's a large, discussion yet, but I think it's definitely something that that's, uh, has an opportunity. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add at the sort of individual faculty level, um, I, I had this in the very first slide I shared that um, if you think about the consumption side of OSS versus the production side of it and this academic freedom lens, we have a lot more influence as an OSPO on the production side, right? So if I tell a faculty member you need to do the following when they have a research grant and they're doing your research, it, alarm bells will go up. But if they're trying to publish or get a grant or do a tech transfer type of arrangement, then they relax that sort of sense of you can't tell me what to do. Um, and so in some sense, the hope is the best practices we introduce to them on that production side, they'll start thinking about on the consumption side, right? So it's not gonna be you must do the following, but if you wanna get these things done, maybe you should have thought about that further, up, you know, further upstream or downstream, sorry. And there was a question. Well, there was there and then there. So the question was for the the video audience was that whether this is uh, we're seeing a push for OSPOs outside of the U.S. So not just U.S. institutions, but inter institutions out in, in other in other countries. Um, I would say, like I, said, I think in Europe there is definitely a, a focus on it. Um, two of the curious members w who don't actually have funding the, the way that most of them have from Sloan Foundation are both from Ireland, um, right? Yeah, they're both Irish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and and there's uh, you may be familiar with CERN, uh, the research institute right. in Europe, so they have formed an OSPO. We've heard that the University of Manchester has an OSPO. We're just not sure yet. It, there is an open research group. We think there's an OSPO there. Uh, there was some discussion about whether University College London has done the same thing. I've spoken to people at Leeds, um, and I know that there's been a lot of activity on the government side in, in Europe. So it, it's probably different, but we're starting to find some connection points, I think. There's one other question there. Okay. Um, Two-part question, really. Um, have you seen any impact uh, on all of this on uh, spin-off activity? Um, and if so, what's the role that the OSPO might play in, in, in that area? Yeah, when you say spin-off, you mean like startups or you mean other types of things? Startups, yeah. yeah. Do you want to start with that? Yeah, I mean, for us, actually, um, when we started Cross, one of the big ideas was, like, oh, we're going to have another Ceph. That's going to be the next thing. We're just going to build another Ceph. So a startup will be the next. <laughs> we'll just be this, you know, a bunch of open source startups. And actually, our experience has been that that isn't the case. But we do have, there's like, we, what we have discovered is multiple pathways that open source projects have been able to kind of move from, um, move from the university setting outside. So in that way, yes, I do see that there is some spinoffs, not always a startup. Although I think now that there's a wider range of OSPOs, I will, would not be surprised if I start to see more of that because I think industry is going to start seeing even more value than they maybe have in the past uh, for working with open source research in, in campuses and being able to kind of promote that. Um, I mean, we've had, you know, we've had our projects kind of like upstreamed and like, you know, adopted or merged into like, um, the Apache, Apache Arrow, for instance, and, and other, and other, I've seen that in other cases where it's, you know, the maintainer has moved on, but it actually consist, has a strong enough community that it's going on. We haven't had like what I would say is a traditional startup setup since the Ceph success, but I do think it's it's something that's likely to happen. Yeah, and it, it's important to note that traditionally it's the technology transfer offices that have had that right. role, 
right, in terms of commercialization, startup, and so on. And I think in both our cases, we have a very good relationship with the tech transfer office. But one key message that some of these hospitals are promoting is just as you said, there are different pathways for impact, sustainability, and so on, right? So introducing the faculty to software foundations, they may not know about those, right, right. Uh, is a yeah. big thing we've been doing, for example. Or that you say you need another developer. Is that really what you need? Yeah. <laughs> maybe you need a community manager. You know, maybe you need a maintainer. Uh, so, you know, these roles are still somewhat unfamiliar to the university set setting. But, you know, a few years ago, we started doing a lot around data management. And now universities have data wranglers, data consultants, whatever. I think the same thing will happen with, uh, with open source. I also want to interject that there is the, um, the push from within NSF and other yeah. agencies, other funding agencies. It's also been super helpful on that. The POSE, the POSE program, uh, particularly phase two pros, POSE uh, grants, I think are kind of that next step. I know they have a very strong SBIR kind of focus on them, which I hesitate a little bit about because I don't feel like that's always perfect for open source, but at least it gives the idea of like, you know, giving these open source uh, maintainers and people working within this open source project, like tools and a, like uh, helping them think through how they want to move their uh, project forward. Um, I have, I do respect like a lot of the discussions we've had with Pose, or with through Curious and us independently with the, through the UC network, is that they do recognize that it's not all about having a spinoff that is a startup, but also all the different pathways that a, an open source ecosystem within a, a university actually can continue, be sustainable, and also have a you know, huge impact, so. Yeah, and, and for those of you who don't know, Pose is Pathways oh, to Open Source Ecosystem. That's a program within NSF. And SBI is a small business program. And I've heard that the one program officer at the oversees both, and he's seeing a rise in open source usage in, in the SBI program. So I, yeah. I think we're starting yeah. to make some inroads. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, the question was what the OSPO role is for maintenance as opposed to novel development. That's a great question. Um, do you have, you want to start? Or? Uh, yeah, that, that came back to that point I was making about people saying, I need resources and that's a developer, right? So the reality is that most grants, the vast majority of grants to university are about novel development, right? Uh, POSE is different, SBIR is different, so on. So they're smaller pockets. I think this is an incredibly important role of the OSPO, is to basically sort of do, one of the reasons we're, we're arguing OSPOs can be connected to libraries is that curation function, mm -hmm. right? Is, does your software actually need to be maintained? Does it need to have a community? Is it having the kind of impact you think it's having? Uh, a lot of software, open source software in universities is used for teaching purposes. I've heard faculty say, I used it to train my grad students and I don't care anymore if anyone ever uses it or so on. So being able to understand all those different kinds of profiles. So the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we had a meeting with them and the Curious Network around their so-called archetypes is trying to think about all those different archetypes for university open source, and then thinking about the right set of resources given the goals that they have. Most faculty immediately jump to, I need a grant for new features without thinking about all those other kinds of questions. And I just highlight that yeah, one of the, um, for one of the um, goals of the, our new funding from Sloan for the network is actually a focus on sustainability, uh, open source software sustainability, uh, particularly from uh, projects coming out of the university. And we're actually trying to uh, have a kind of a pilot for containerization that kind of focuses on that. And we're also including a hiring of a ma uh, community manager. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's definitely a big push within what we're looking at is kind of kind of creating a, a, a team of folks who can, uh, uh, can maintain projects that are seen as valuable to maintain within the university setting and supposed to, you know, because it also often it's going to be better for a project maybe to leave the university, at, you know, it gets mature and then goes somewhere else. Um, but um, there are ones where uh, the path is actually better to kind of figure out a way of maintaining it. Our, our uh, genomics institute, um, so where the human genome browser kind of came from, um, is, is kind of a good case of that, where they have a very strong kind of developer community within there, within the Genomics Institute, and they're actually able to maintain their projects that way. And so we're kind of using them as a, as a good model as well. So. Yeah, one thing I keep saying is your grad student didn't necessarily yeah. come to grad school yeah, to be a maintainer. maintainer. <laughs> so. 
I think we're over. Oh. But if you have questions, yep. we'll be up here and, and we'll be out in the hallway as well. So thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you.